and this is what I tell people on pets. You can just name your next door neighbor to get fluffy, right? You want your dog to go to the next door neighbor, not a problem. However, you better make sure that that neighbor is actually going to take care of Fluffy and that they're not going to turn it over to a shelter or I've had people want to take them to the vet and euthanize them. When I was doing volunteer work for um, a no-kill shelter, we would get those calls where someone brought an animal in because their, their parent passed away and now they have this dog or cat or whatever and they take it to the vet asking it to be euthanized, not because there's anything wrong with it because they don't uh. want to take care of it and then they would, you know, convince them to transfer it over to the, to the rescue. Um, so that kind of stuff can happen and especially if you're leaving money so people think welcome donna to sunday communion good morning thank you for having me so happy to have you <laughs> we're gonna have a great conversation about your profession which is fascinating to me. It's also a little scary to me. And um, I, I think it's important for all of us to know how to understand estate planning, mm -hmm. but also the element that makes you extra special is your connection, your uh, spiritual connection to your clients and to the content. Mm -hmm. So if you would start us out by just kind of giving us a little background. Yeah. So um, my undergrad is in accounting and then I went to law school. So I did CPA work for seven years before I started my law firm. And I just fell into estate planning of all the areas of law. I struggle with being an attorney every day, but with all the areas of law there is to practice in, estate planning is the only one that I could actually do. Uh, it is not easy being spiritual in the legal field. It is a very dark industry. Um, there are some good attorneys out there, but if you think about it, most of what we do are lawsuits against other people or threatening to sue other people. Even estate planning going through probate is a lawsuit. And so, and so I'm very fortunate that I did Fought, you know, like I accidentally fell into estate planning. Um, I know now, obviously, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And so how did you fall into it? When I was in law school, I was about halfway through and just I was sitting there learning how to argue cases and everything is fighting and how you learn to be an attorney is from reading prior court cases, which is all litigation. And I just thought, this is not me. What am I doing here? I do not want to do this. But I'm halfway through. Now what do I do? So I said, well, finish. You never have to practice law. Um, having a degree, a law degree will help you. You know, you could be a CEO of a company. You could do whatever you want with a law degree. You don't have to practice law. So I said, okay, I'll finish. Um, but I knew I'd never be a practicing attorney. And one of the classes I took was estate planning and specifically because I was interested in it because I had desert tortoises and they live to be a hundred years old. And what do we do with desert tortoises? Um, if statistically I will pass away before the desert tortoises <laughs> do, right? And then as I got into it, I learned that it's an issue with um, some birds live to be 80 to a hundred years old. So same thing, people pass away. And what do you do with your bird? And then horses, they live to be 30 or 40 years old and you just can't give your neighbor a horse. You know, you got to have the money to take care of them because they're very expensive in the room and all that. So in that, I learned about planning for pets. So that is why I took the classes because I wanted to know what do we do with these guys? It wasn't, wasn't anything advertised in the class, but you know, I planning was important to me. You know, I took that class and um, challenged the teacher on some things because he shared his documents with us and did it, you know, tactfully. But you just like, you know, what you're telling us are in these documents or not what I'm reading. And he went back and read them and came back and he said, you're right, they're not worded correctly. And so he fixed them. And this was a practicing attorney. And when I graduated from um, law school and I, took, I, him and I went and had lunches, we kind of stayed friendly. And I said, I have no idea what I want to do with this law degree. And he said, in all the years he's been teaching, he's only ever known two students that could start their own law firm out of law school. And I was one of them. Yeah. And initially I said, you know, I did what we all do is, oh, he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And, you know, I was in shock. And so I went home and after a couple of days, I thought, okay, he must see something in me that I don't see in myself. I mean, the law is, it's overwhelming. I was new to it. I couldn't imagine, you know, just starting my own law firm. And after a few days, I just said, okay, he sees something I don't see. So now what do I need to do start to start my law firm? And I 
ordered a book and started reading and set up my law firm and, and he helped me, you know, he was there. If I had questions, I never just called him and said, okay, this is what I have. What's the answer. It was, here's my issue. This is what I read to be the law. This is what the documents I want to produce or how I need to write it. And he'd always come back and say, yes, that's correct. And so, or if I didn't know a way, he'd point me in the right direction. And he's been my mentor, you know, now I've been practicing for 19 years. I don't call on him as often. But um, in the beginning, he was instrumental in me having this. And had I not met him, had I not had that lunch, I would not be here today. He was one of those people that He's an probably, angel. right, an angel that a soul supporter that yep. was dropped in at a very specific time in your lifespan right. to guide you. Mm -hmm. And if we believe that we come in with a contract or a plan, we do have free will and that would guide us along the way. He was one of those markers. So Correct. was that in Nevada? I am licensed to practice law in Nevada and Washington state. So okay. anything we talk about today will be based on Nevada law. So okay. what I'm talking about, you can't apply to any other state. It will only apply to the state of Nevada. So always, you know, see your own attorney. But um, I do travel back and forth. I, I travel between Las Vegas and Florida. Las Vegas will always be my home. I've lived there almost my entire life and it's where my practice is. I am not licensed to practice law in the state of Florida. I don't want to be. Um, mm -hmm. I love my clients in Nevada and that's that's where my heart is with my with my law firm. Um, and then I did have a home in Washington state. So I got licensed up there and I've had a lot of work up there. And um, same thing, I know those people that call me that are put are put in front of me for a reason and I know that I'm there to help them how people find me I don't know because I don't do advertising I do have a website but I don't advertise and solicit and all that but pe the universe knows how to put people in front of me whether they're in Washington or in Nevada the law is different in every state but is there a overarching theme if you will about the law in estate planning <laughs> Yes, I would say, um, again, I don't know the law in every state, but in general, every state has probate. People think that if you have a will and you pass away, you avoid probate. I am not aware of any state where that is a correct statement. It may be out there because I don't know all the states, but anyone that I've ever worked with, and I have clients all over the United States, you know, that were in Nevada and then moved out of state. I've never found a state that did not have probate. The issue becomes is how easy or how difficult is the probate? So in Nevada, it is more difficult. California, very difficult. Difficult in that it's expensive and time consuming. Um, other places on the East Coast, I've had clients that their spouse passed away in, say, New York or New Jersey or their parents, and those probates went pretty easily. You know, you go to court, you get permission to access assets, and then you can go about and do your thing. Washington State is the same way. Washington is much easier. My probate's up there. The, the only thing that makes Washington more different is a lot of the smaller counties, they don't have electronic filing, and you have to call and talk to people, like the mailing things in, mm -hmm. in the mail. It sounds silly, but that's just not the world we live like in. And so, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It takes time. And they don't accept things via email, even you have to mail, still mail documents. It's kind of crazy. But um, Washington, you go in, in it, depending on the county, um, it's relatively same, but it's a much shorter process than Nevada. But you get someone named as administrator and they become the person who's in charge of everything and the court doesn't have to sign off on anything. Nevada is not like that. Everything has to be or a majority of things have to be approved through the court. So if you have a house and we have to go through probate, we have to get permission from the court to sell that house. We have to have a hearing for the judge wow. to approve the house to be sold. It's not like that in Washington and it's not like that in some other states, but but a lot of states it is and it, and it makes it much more difficult. So with living in the world of where, where we are, mm -hmm. um, we do hear a lot of people passing, even at younger ages. Even my son, who is you know a young adult, a friend of his just passed away. And it got me thinking, and, and we want to believe that we'll live forever or for a we long do. time. <laughs> in right? this <laughs> lifetime, maybe not, right? but yes, and we do. I, idea of thinking about planning your funeral or your death right. must be very uncomfortable for some people. You know, those of you who are watching this probably already know that I had a near-death experience. So transitioning 
um, is not a problem for me. I'm looking forward to that, not meaning that I want to exit now, but so the idea of death is not uncomfortable for me. But I also only have one child. And so the idea of planning ahead for him so that it is a smooth process, even to the point where when I recently moved, I went through my garage and all my, you know, keepsakes and things like that. And I just got rid of almost everything, made separate boxes. Like when I die here, you can throw that out without even looking at it. This is the stuff that I kept for you. Um, just making it easy mm -hmm. for that process because your loved ones are going to grieve no matter how old you are. Right. And to have to think, oh, what are the steps now? What am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. How do I gain access to the bank account? How do I gain access to passwords? Or if you have intellectual property or if you have uh, royalties coming mm -hmm. in, you know, how does all that work if you don't plan ahead? And you said something so important, which is about the pets. Are people really planning for their pets? What's going to happen? And the fact that you are so passionate about animals, it is a, a beautiful integration of your profession and your passion. Yeah. I'll back up and explain estate planning as Great isn't as easily as I can. So if you have, an, and again, remember, I'm speaking about Nevada, so other states may be a little bit different, but in general, things are kind of the same. It just is, again, how the court process works. But if you have a will or if you have nothing, it's kind of the same process. The only difference that a will does is when you submit it to court, it tells the judge who you want to be administrator of the estate and where you want your assets distributed. In Nevada, the the judge can overrule your wishes and do a different type of distribution. If you do not have a will, then then you there are rules that the Nevada Vice Statute says who can be administrator and how your assets are going to be distributed. So the only difference between nothing is a, and a will is you're telling the judge in writing what it is that you want. Whether or not the judge follows that is a whole other story, okay? But it has to go through probate, and this is why. If I own a house that is in my name and you want to purchase my house, right? We're both alive. You want to buy my house. If the way we do that is I sign a deed transferring the house from me to you, the deed gets recorded and the house is yours. It's just that simple. But if I pass away, I'm not here to sign that deed transferring the house from me to you and I'm the legal owner of the house. So now we have to go to probate court. We have to get someone named as an administrator, put the house on the market, when we get an offer, it has to go back to court. The court has to approve it. There are um, investors that come in that can come into probate court and outbid the person that per is trying to purchase the house. Um, so sometimes we get into bidding wards over that. And then ultimately somebody ends up buying the house and we get the court order that gets recorded. And the administrator is the one who's signing off on that deed, transferring the house now from my estate to you. Okay. When you set up a trust, as trust is just a legal document, but the purpose of the legal document is to own ownership of your assets. So now I have a trust and my trust is the legal owner of my house. Now, when I pass away and you want to buy my house, you don't need me to sign off on that deed because I'm not the legal owner of the house. The trust is. And whoever I've named in the documents to be successor trustee can sign on that deed transferring the house from my trust to you. It avoids court because you don't need we don't need an administrator. We have a trustee. Everything's in writing. It's a legal binding document. It avoids court. It's not a public record. Like a will is a public record. Everybody can see it gets recorded. Trusts don't get recorded and they're not a public record, but wills do. So when you have a trust, if you have someone who you don't want to get your assets, we can intentionally fail to provide for them. And as long as they are not listed in the trust document, they're not legally entitled to a copy of it. And then you can't contest what you can't have a copy of. You know, where a will is public record. So everybody's legally entitled to see that will, even your next door neighbor. So what if you have property outside of the state that you reside in? So um, you still title in the name of the trust. So you pick the state that you're going to have your trust in. And then 
any assets you have outside of the state, we just, I work with attorneys all over that they prepare a deed in their state transferring that, that asset into your trust. Um, because in order to avoid probate, everything has to be titled in the name of the trust. And it doesn't matter what state the asset is in. What matters is that it's titled into a really good trust. You don't want to go online. I wouldn't recommend going online and doing a trust. If you read the fine print, it will say things like it may not comply with the laws of your state um, because there's no way they can, no one company can know the laws of every single state in one area of law, right? You just can't. Um, there are some companies that only have three page trusts. Well, my pa my trusts are 30 to 60 pages long, depending on what we're writing in them. You cannot compare that document. You can't have everything in the Nevada Revised Statute and everything in the court cases in a trust if it's only three pages long. So how much protection are you getting? Will that trust even comply with the laws of Nevada if someone can test it or if there's an asset not titled in the trust when you pass away and we have to go to court, the judge is going to say this doesn't even comply with the laws of Nevada. Now we're back to having nothing. Right. Okay. You know? So, so it's not just about doing planning. It's about doing very good planning. It's about doing the right kind of planning for you. And it doesn't matter if you have no children, if you have one child, if you have multiple children, it's always an issue if you have assets. I've had next door neighbors try to go after assets. I've had gardeners try to go oh. after assets, right? It doesn't matter when money's involved, people come out of the woodwork. Yeah. What if there are no assets? What if there's only debt? What happens to debt when someone passes? If there are relatives, if, are they responsible? Not if it's a not if it's a non-spouse. So Nevada Revised Statute states that debt of a spouse is your debt also, and that's because Nevada is a community property state. So assets mm -hmm. are community property, debts community property. But most credit card companies don't know that that's the law and or they don't want to go to court to try and get the money. So most of the time, the debt doesn't get paid by anybody. But if it's not a spouse, the child, the friend, the partner that you live with, whatever, they are not legally liable for debt. And then what about uh, your the health aspect of this? Um, I don't know the terminology of yep. the form. Uh, health directive, maybe? Medical, medical power of attorney. Okay. So um, I'm thinking also when children become adult age, mm -hmm. 18, and now we have HIPAA laws, as a parent, you will always parent that child, no matter how old that child is. Right. But at 18, they have now become an adult. So you have, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you have no uh, say in the matter. Right. You have no legal standing correct with your children, with anybody over the age of 18, um, unless they have, uh, so we'll also talk about special needs kids because that we have that issue as well. Um, but with um, individuals, once you turn 18, a parent has no, they can't get medical information about them per HIPAA laws. You can't even get medical information about your spouse. I mean, HIPAA specifically says nobody can get medical information about you without your consent. So if you go into the hospital and you have your spouse, the doctors and nurses technically are supposed to not release that information to you without either having it in writing, having a HIPAA legal document, or when you go into the hospital, you're, you're always signing forms of who can they, they can release medical information to you too. But if you can't speak on your own behalf, someone suffers a stroke or is in a car accident and they can't speak, legally, they're not supposed to release that information. With spouses, they usually release the information, but this is why they shouldn't. I have had spouses, I have had clients that were legally married that did not live with their spouse and did not want their spouse to have any information about them. So when people assume just because you are married that you want that spouse to get medical information about you, that is wrong. You cannot assume that. But doctors and hospitals do. Um, now, with children, though, they they're not supposed to. Some follow the rules, some don't. Same thing with like same sex couples. If they're not legally married, some will allow, will release the information, some won't. You can also walk into a hospital and say that you're somebody's husband and not a wife and not actually be married to them and they'll release the information to you. My first question when I get contacted by hospitals is where's the legal document that allowed you to release information to that person? Because I've had like um, people say they're their daughter when they're not and they've 
they've released information. And I'm like, show me the legal document that said they had legal authority to get information. And they're like, we don't have it. And I said, of course they, you don't have it because there, it doesn't exist because I created the document and that person does not have legal authority to get medical information about that person. I don't care who they say, what their relationship is. So everybody, everybody, everybody should have two documents. And again, we, this is what we call them in the state of Nevada. We figure out what it is in your state, but a medical power of attorney, which puts in writing whether or not you basically, whether or not you want to be on life support or a feeding tube. And then, um, and who's going to be making those decisions for you if you can't speak on your own behalf and make your own decisions. And then the HIPAA authorization, which is really a federal form. It's not necessarily state specific because HIPAA is a federal law um, because nobody is supposed to be able to get information about you without your consent. So if you put it in writing, could be that you want your parents to get medical information about you or your friend um, that is um, helping you out or you have a partner that you live with, but you're not married. So you want to get those two, at least those two documents for everybody. Okay. Now, when you have children that are special needs, and that could be whatever. It could be Down syndrome child, um, autistic children. It could be a child who at 18 wasn't and then had a car accident and now they are legally incompetent or unable to manage their affairs. Once a child turns 18, you have to go to court and get guardianship over them. So you prior to 18 for medical, financial is different, but for medical prior to 18, you make all the decisions for them. Once they turn 18, you have to get a guardianship over a child if they're not able to care for themselves or make medical decisions, you know, whatever their underlying disability is. So then you have to get guardianship and your guardian over them either until they don't need it anymore or until they are, till they pass away, right? Or till you pass away and someone else gets named guardian. The money side of things is different. When you are leaving money to a child under the age of 18, so let's say you're a grandparent and you want to leave money to your grandchild or your, your, your great nieces and nephews, if that child is under the age of 18, when you pass away and you leave it to them outright, the parent of that child has to go to court and get guardianship over that money. So mm. just because they are the parent, they don't have legal authority to act on behalf of money for that child. So they have to get guardianship over that child for the money portion to be able to access. So people will leave a grandchild as the beneficiary on a life insurance policy or an IRA or something like that. That parent, because the child can't sign on their own behalf, you know, under 18, that parent has to have guardian over that child. So it's really never a good idea to leave a child money outright. It's better to leave it for them in trust so that one, we avoid guardianship, but two, we can control when the child gets it because you never want to leave a million dollars to an 18 year old. They're just not, you know, our brains aren't even fully developed at age 18. And then we're asking them to make these grown up decisions. Um, I was 19 when I bought my first house. And even though I was financially savvy and able to, you know, make those decisions, I still make decisions different today than I would have at age 19. Sure. And even though I was a saver and all that stuff, I, you really don't understand money also when you don't earn it. It's different when it's given to you versus when you earn it. You appreciate it more when you earn it than when it's given to you. So, you know, when you have a trust and then set up and we name someone as a beneficiary, we can control, like give a third at age 25, a third at age 30, a third at age 35, or whatever. Some kids, you can never give it all outright to them because they're going to spend it. You know, there are just some kids that you, you give them $500,000 and it will be gone with nothing to show for it. Right. You know, so, um, so every child's different. We don't have to do the distributions the same to every child because they all have different needs. Then we also have to deal with what if your child is married and there's an issue with that spouse? Does that spouse have a gambling problem? Well, Nevada is a community property state. So you give money to your child and Nevada law says inheritance or separate property. But as soon as your child puts their spouse's name on that bank account or house or whatever you give them, it's automatically converted to community property. And now they've lost half the equity or half the money in the bank account. If 
it's a retirement account versus a house versus money, you know, is the asset going to be sold? So would a house be sold and then the money be put into a um, investment account under the trust until the child becomes a certain age? Can the money be used for their education? Because most of the time we want kids to have access to go to college. So at age 18, when they graduate, there's money in there that can go to college if you want. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways that we can write it and we can put anything in writing as long as it's not illegal. There are just some things we can't put in writing, but if it's legal, we can, we can come up with as many crafty ideas as we want. Well, and I had heard something recently about pets that I thought was fascinating. And that is if you have pets and you want them cared for in a particular manner, this gal wrote into her living trust that, that the person can live in her house and that two different vets before that animal would be put down, let's say, because of illness, that she would have two different vets confirm that. So there were so many variables mm -hmm. in that to protect the animal. Yeah. Right. So my pet section um, for when people do exactly what you're talking about is 10 pages long. So wow. it's a lot of language in there, right? A lot of information. So we can do anything. This is what I tell people on pets. You can just name your next door neighbor to get fluffy, right? You want your dog to go to the next door neighbor, not a problem. However, you better make sure that that neighbor is actually going to take care of Fluffy and that they're not going to turn it over to a shelter or I've had people want to take them to the vet and euthanize them. When I was doing volunteer work for um, a no-kill shelter, we would get those calls where someone brought an animal in because their, their parent passed away and now they have this dog or cat or whatever and they take it to the vet asking it to be euthanized, not because there's anything wrong with it because they don't uh. want to take care of it and then they would, you know, convince them to transfer it over to the, to the rescue. Um, so that kind of stuff can happen and especially if you're leaving money so people will say well I want to leave them five thousand dollars or a thousand dollars as a thank you well once they get fluffy in the money there's nothing legally we can do and then that animal can be taken to the government kill shelter or whatever um, so let's back up and kind of talk about pets because it's really it's, it's a much bigger picture than just that okay so if you live alone and you have an animal and let's say someone hasn't seen you, so they do a wellness check, you don't show up for work, your neighbors haven't seen you, you haven't put your trash out, you're not answering the door, whatever the case may be. And the police come, they get into your house and they see that you've passed away and you have an animal. By Nevada law, that animal has to be taken to the government kill shelter. It is a high government kill shelter, okay? So when you have, so now, you have to show some legal authority to get that animal because unfortunately under Nevada law, that animal is property. It's no different than your television set. So let's say I'm the next door neighbor and I say, okay, my, I see the police are there. They tell me my neighbor passed away. And I said, well, my neighbor, you know, she wanted me to get fluffy and I'm going to take care of her. That's no different than me walking in saying my neighbor said I could have the TV and the couch and the gun collection because fluffy is considered property, just like all those other things. Thing. So they will not turn over Fluffy to the neighbor. They have to take it to the government shelter. Now, the neighbor has no legal authority to go and get Fluffy out of the shelter, and we don't want them euthanized, plus the trauma they go through, and they're depressed, and, you know, they can euthanize them for any reason, and an animal that's just lost their parent, you know, they, they're they attached to them, and they go into these shelters, and they are depressed, and if right. they could euthanize them for that reason, you know, so we want to keep them. That's why I got into planning for pets. Pets. My logo, my tagline is estate planning for people and pets. I want to make sure these guys don't end up at the government kids shelter. Yes. I don't care where they go. I just want them to be safe. Um, so now if you have a trust set up, we have a plan in place that says who's going to get fluffy. What does that look like? Whether we have temporary caregivers, which could be the neighbor, maybe the neighbor's just going to come over. So now they have an actual legal document that they can show saying, I have legal authority to take possession of fluffy. Okay. If they still won't advise, you know, adhere to that and they take them to the shelter, the, the shelter will, because I've had to show documents to the shelter once they see them. But most of the time they will release the animal. But if they don't and they go to the shelter, then the shelter always releases them because they know in Nevada law, we can set it up in a trust. Okay. You can't do this kind of stuff in will-based planning. You have to have a trust per the Nevada revised statute. So now we have a backup plan. Who's the temporary caregiver if we need one to get immediate possession? 
Um, there are things that you don't think about. People will say, well, um, the dog can stay living in the house. Well, what if there was a crime scene? So somebody broke into your house and they shot, not you, but you know, someone gets shot mm -hmm. and now the police come and now the person is dead and there's the dog. We have to get the dog out of the house because it's a crime scene. You can't have the dog ruining evidence. So we have to have a temporary something like in writing foster. that mm -hmm, yep we call them temporary caregivers who's going to take that dog temporarily maybe you do want it to go to your son but your son lives out of state we need immediate action with getting the dog out of the house and place somewhere safe so we have a temporary caregiver and then when your son comes then in the language it says the dog can be transferred to your son okay so there's a lot of variables you have to think uh, you know what if the house catches on fire and now you the dog there's no place for the dog to live um or we can't get someone to come in and take care of them every day, but they can go to a temporary place where they're cared for. Then we can set it up as easy as, you know, the next door neighbor or a son or someone's taking the animal, or it can be very comprehensive where I've written these up many a times, the house stays in trust. We name a caregiver, the caregiver stays living in the house. They stay there rent free. They have to pay the utilities, but they stay there rent free. The trust pays like the HOA dues, the real estate taxes, the mortgage if there is any. Sometimes we pay the mortgage off, you know, whatever ha whatever we want to put in writing, we can. Now the caregiver's laying there, staying there and their compensation is basically free rent to care for the animals. Uh, so they could go and get another job, you know, but they're living there for free usually. Some We can pay caregiver fees. We can give the caregiver $100 a month to help, you know, to just say, here's your fee for staying in the house. Um, and then the trust pays for all expenses of the animals. So the vet bills, the teeth cleaning, if the caregiver has to go on vacation, the animal needs to be boarded or somebody else needs to come in for a week and stay at the house uh, with the animals. Um, you know, all of that can be put in writing of how that, what that looks like. And then as to, you were saying, what happens if the animal has to be put down or what if there has to be a medical um, treatment? I work with the docs and rescue and the biggest issue with dachshunds is they have to have back surgery. It's almost, it's almost not a matter of if it's when, right? They are really? almost, I didn't know that. yeah, a lot of docs end up having to have back surgery because they're so long that they, they kind of go like they bow in the middle, you know, they need feet in the middle of their body to hold up their body. And so they end up getting herniated discs and stuff. So very common. Everyone who owns a dachshund knows that there's a very good chance you're going to have to have back surgery. So I always write language in there about, um, making sure there's money set aside to do the back surgery because we want to try it. If the animal's going to be paralyzed on its back end, that's ultimately what's going to happen anyway. But most people want to make the attempt first to have the surgery. If we, some people are open to acupuncture because that works incredibly well. I've done it with my own dogs and you know, there's, there's a lot of great alternative medicine out there too, but we just know with dachshunds, you have money set aside to do back surgery and physical therapy. A lot of people do that with their dachshunds and other dogs too, but dachshunds is just really, really big in that community. I've had clients where they have um, the brachial cephalus dogs, which are the squish nose like the boxers oh. uh, right that um those dogs can't swim and so if they're going to leave their how their dog to someone who has a pool i've had to write in there that um they that the trust can buy a pool cover and a very specific kind of pool cover it has to be one that the dog can walk on and not fall under you know, so, so there's things like that. I mean, I've written that they have certain kind of specific toys that they like, and the trust has to be able, to, I mean, the trust can pay for toys anyway, but some people want to put it in like, this is what my dog has to have this toy. And you have to keep them on this kind of food. And we get people with dogs that are bonded. The dogs have to stay together. You know, um, I've been on estates where the person had 16 cats. Now I get it. We're not supposed to have that many animals, but what do you do with 16 cats? You know, it's not, it's hard to place cats period and yeah. they're at the kill shelter that it's you know a high much higher kill rate on cats than dogs so what do we do you know how do we what's the plan to get these taken care of yeah i was just going to ask you about cats and then you brought uh -huh. it up which yeah. is interesting uh -huh. it's psychic yeah and then i talked um, about you know the the birds um parrots and people don't understand you get a parrot as a baby and you rate them a lot of time raise them you, you know people get them right from the egg and that 
bird gets so bonded with that person that when the person dies, the bird starts, will pluck its feathers. I don't know if you've ever seen a completely bald that. bird. Yeah, it's very sad, but that's what they do. You know, it's their anxiety, how they, how they process. And so, you know, what can we do? How do we get them into a house where the person understands how to work with a bird with that? Can the bird be bonded to another person? Can we get them to stop plucking? Because there's a lot of stuff that you don't think about, but when a bird lives to be 80 to 100 years old, even if you got a bird at age 18, it's you're, you know, the bird's going to outlive you. So now we've talked about so many uh, variables to uh, uh, estate planning and a living trust. What if there are a lot of people that are financially suffering right mm -hmm. now and they want this protection? Maybe they have a pet or they are holistic in nature in the mm -hmm. way that they want to approach their medical care and um, maybe their family is not holistic. Mm -hmm. Is there, what is kind of like the baseline of protection that they could do? And I don't know if you can even quote a rate, but kind of like, what is the baseline versus these, you know, deeper levels of need with, uh, with assets? So, at the very least, like I said, everybody should have the two medical documents, the medical power of attorney and the HIPAA authorization. Everybody should have that. In Nevada, the medical power of attorney is free. You can Google it. I know you can buy it like that. There's a, a company called Nevada Legal Forms, um, I believe, at the UPS stores. I don't know if the post office has it, but the UPS stores have um, the, the these medical power of attorneys that you can either those stores you pay for them, whatever, $50, it's minimal. But but the medical power of attorney I have found online, you can get it for free. And I think in a lot of states, you can get that document for free. Um, the HIPAA authorization, I've never looked it up, but I would imagine you probably could get one for free. If not, you can get them from, um, again, Nevada Legal Forms or uh, UPS stores, those kind of places that sell those forms. So at the very least, get that. The sad thing is with your animals, the the Nev go ahead i want to ask you a question yep. about that yeah. do you then have to file that form no that so you can nevada the nevada secretary of state has some this lock box i've never used it before you can file it i don't know how that works how you get access to it um how would you even know somebody had a form filed with the lockbox? Mm -hmm. and then so for me i just say have the forms and like put them on your refrigerator you know what I mean? Like put them somewhere or tell your kids or tell your neighbors. Um, usually family is called if something were to happen to you. So if you pass away, the police will find out who your next of kin is. If you don't have children, they'll go to your parents or siblings and they'll call them. So I always tell my clients, like I give them extra business cards and I say, if something happens to you, tell your trustees, tell your family members, you give them my contact information. Nobody needs to know what you have in writing because it's nobody's business why you're alive, but let them know you've taken care of all of your documents and to call my attorney and she'll know what to do. But for people that don't have assets, so let's say you live in an apartment and you have a bank account and you're living paycheck to paycheck, which, you know, what, 95% of the population right. have no money, right? 5% have money, 1% have all the money. So it's, so it's a big need for that 95% of the population. So have your medical documents in place. Um, if you have a bank account and you're living paycheck to paycheck, by the time all your bills come out after you pass away, there's not going to be left anything left for anyone to get access to. Nevada does have a an affidavit of small estate. So if your estate is under, it's either twenty or twenty five thousand dollars now. Um, you can present a document to a bank and get access to the account potentially. And I say that because I've had two different clients where the banks would not release the funds, even with an affidavit of small estate, they made us go to court. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one was for $5,000. I forget how much the other one was for, but I've had to do it twice. So you don't want to rely on that, but um, worst case scenario, the person walks away from it. You know what I mean? Like there's just no, there's $5 left in the bank. You're not going to go to court over something like that. So you want to get your medical ones. As far as the animals go, this is the hard part because Nevada law, I mean, it says in the Nevada Vice statute, the only way you can provide for your pet is in a trust. So you can't even do it in a will. You could potentially put it in a will, but I can't tell you that anybody's going to 
make that enforceable. I don't know if anybody would comply with it because it's not per the Nevada Revised Statute. So can you put it even like on a piece of paper, I want Fluffy to go to my next door neighbor and sign and date it? I mean, you can do anything you want, but but by law, the animal control is required to take that animal to the government kill shelter. You know, if you're home alone, if you're with your spouse and you pass away, the spouse is gonna keep the animal, it's not a problem. It only becomes a problem when there's only one of you left right or you become legally incompetent you can't manage your own affairs you have alzheimer's or something um, we need a safe place for that animal to go to so if you can plan if you know you're getting to that point and you can then transfer the animal we can do that um, but yeah with the animals it's hard because you can only do it in a trust so for those 95 percent of the people that don't need a trust it's a problem so if you have a house you should have a trust. I understand it costs money to set up a trust, but houses, even with a will, have to go through probate. It falls outside of that $20,000 asset um, small affidavit. With a house, because it's real property, it has to go to court. Um, so if you have a house with, I've had clients with $20,000 in equity, it's worth it to go to probate. Even if half of it goes to attorney fees and court fees, the family's still getting the other 10,000. So you do with houses, you really should have a trust set up. Whether you do it with an attorney like me, like I said, I wouldn't recommend doing it online, but if that's your only option, if that's all you can afford, something may be better than nothing, but I can't guarantee you that that document is going to avoid probate because if it's not done correctly, if it doesn't comply with the laws, we are going to end up in court because the title company won't transfer that house to the new buyer if it's not a good trust document. And it, at the basic form, let's say a young adult doesn't have a home but has a bank account and, and he wants to set this up or she wants to set this up, what would that run him in Nevada? Um, so a single person with me, now keep in mind, I have really high right. quality documents, right? There, You sure. can work with other attorneys that are going to be less and others that are more expensive. I picked middle of the road because I wanted to help as many people as I could. So for me, a single person, it's $3,000. A married couple, it's $3,500. If a child only has one bank account and he's living or she is living paycheck to paycheck, they could name their parent as a beneficiary, okay? The downside to doing that big picture planning is that that only works if that child passes away. So if that child ends up in a car accident and right. you need access to that money, we have to go to guardianship court. And then when they pass away, we have to go to probate court. So if it's a small amount of money, you, they can name you as, I mean, they can name you as a beneficiary with a large amount of money, but if it's a small amount of money and they want to name you as a beneficiary just for that interim of they're just turned 18 and they don't have a lot of assets yet, um, go ahead and do that. Um, but just know the downside to that is you will not have access to that money if ever during their lifetime they become legally incompetent. And I've had clients get in motorcycle accidents that had to learn how to talk and walk again. During that whole process, you don't have legal access to that money. You know, I just want to say kind of as a disclaimer that and I want to thank you for giving uh, just a, a baseline understanding of what uh, estate planning mm -hmm. would cost but that that is also up for change as your rates change and things like that. That's just at this point in time, I just want to make that indicate. <laughs> indicate Correct. That. Yes. That's at, right. that we're talking yeah. today, right? If you yeah. come see me in 10 years from now, okay. I would imagine my prices are going to have gone up. Yeah. But yes, this is <laughs> right. being recorded in, what are we in? 2024. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I want to protect yeah. you. No, you're, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so the older kids get and the more assets they have, um, now the, the other thing people tell me and ki parents do this, and I beg all my clients not to do this. I'm here to part of my role on this planet is to educate people. That's why I set up my law firm. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me if a client, if someone uses me or not, I talk to people, I don't charge a consultation fee. I give out this information for free. It is more important to me that you work with an attorney that is that you are in alignment with, that you can have a long-term relationship with, 
I want to educate people. If you want to go and work with somebody else, please do. You know, if I'm not the right person for you, but please work with somebody and get this kind of stuff done. What parents will say is, well, I just want to add my child onto my bank account. Now, if it's added on correctly, then as soon as a parent passes away, it automatically goes to that child. Or if the parent becomes incompetent, the child has access to the money. But what parents don't understand is the child could go also go in and wipe out that account completely and leave the parent with no money. And I know parents say, oh, my child would never do that. But I'm here to tell you this stuff happens time and time again. And sometimes it's not your child that's the problem. It's your child's spouse. A lot of times, especially with guys, guys that are in abusive relationships don't talk about it. They could have a wife who is verbally or physically abusive and nobody knows. And now you've got, or you have the nagging wife, right? What people say nagging wife and they're after you, you know, that, you know, go get your mom's money and you go over there and you take care of her and your brother and sister don't do anything. And you're the one going and getting the groceries. You should be paid for your time. You need to start taking that money out. And right? I mean, you have no idea wow. what goes on behind closed doors and people feel pressure who maybe wouldn't access that money that end up accessing the money. The other thing is once you add somebody to your bank account, that becomes community money. And now if your son or daughter files for bankruptcy, is your money subject to that bankruptcy? Because his or her name is on your bank account. What if they get into a car accident and they get a judgment above and beyond their policy limits, which happens? They can come after that money in that joint bank account. At the very least for half, they can make a claim and say, well, half of that money's the child's because his name's on it jointly. So half is yours, half is the child's. You don't want to lose half your assets. That is not a way to do planning. Like I said, I beg people, please don't do planning like that. Go work with any attorney, do anything, but don't do that kind of planning. What about transfer on death? That's indicator the same thing on, as a, a, on a bank account. That's the same thing as a beneficiary. Again, okay. it's only okay when the person passes away, but statistically you're three times more likely to become disabled than mm. you are pass away in any given year. So for that interim of when you're legally com competent until you pass away, that's my, where I'm concerned about. And with a will, we can't do planning during that time, but with a trust, we can. So that's why it's so important if people have assets. You don't have to be a multi-million Millionaire. Um, I have my youngest clients are 18 years old and yes, they own a house and have a bank account and they need a trust, you know, and they, and if you travel anything like that, because you just don't know what's going to happen. I love the idea of it being just a common thing that when your child turns 18, that they then get a living trust. Mm hmm that uh, they start learning to put their assets in the trust from the very beginning. Right. Um, I think that's, that's a great idea. The other thing that I wanted to ask you about is um, cord blood, where mm -hmm. you have, once your child is born, you take the umbilical cord and then it's cryovac or whatever, and mm -hmm. you save it for the DNA purposes for whatever, if they need stem cells, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So what happens to, I'm going to call that an asset. That's like a medical asset. What do you what do you do with that within a, a living trust? So I have never had anybody ask to title that in the name of the trust. But if the company that is storing that blood allows us to title in the name of the trust, I would absolutely say that needs to be titled in the name of the trust. Who is the owner of that asset, right? If it's my... It's, it's the core. If I had a child, it would be the core blood. So it, is it my asset? Is it the child's assets? Like who does it belong to from the standpoint of the organization that is storing the blood? Once we know that, that's whose trust it would go in if they allow that. Now, they may not for some reason. And so you have to ask them, OK, what documents do we have in place? Who can use that blood? Because can that blood now, let's say you have a child and that child's child can that be used for that child for some reason? Because if you know anything about epigenetics um, and the ability for these to these cells to turn in to be anything, we can make them into whatever we want and then put them into somebody else's body. And then, yes, you may have to be on anti-rejection medicine, but we can use these cells to make any organ or any tissue or whatever it is that we need to make just by changing the what it's in, what it grows in, mm -hmm. the medium, the culture medium. You know, so then who becomes, who is the legal owner? That's what I would, that's what we need to know. Once we know who the legal owner is, we can figure out how to get that into the trust. 
What is the strangest thing that you have had to deal with in your practice over, you said, 19 years? That would be No, I mean, nothing, nothing is strange to me. Nothing is surprising. <laughs> I think the most difficult for me is watching people steal from seniors and mistreat mm-hmm. seniors. You know, that's what really bothers me. But um, I don't know. I think because I've been exposed to so much and I know I live in a world of infinite possibilities, nothing really surprises me. And when people come into me and want to talk about what they think is, um, you know, weird or different, um, just is normal to me. It's just, you know, so whether people want to donate their so- uh, bodies to science, you know, that bodies um, exhibit, right? They, there's that where you could be used for that, where you can harvest your organs and be used for science and different types of things. Um, people want to be, you know, cremated and be uh, planted with a tree or in a whatever jar in the ocean. And um, we get really creative. Um I've had clients ask me to help them commit suicide. Obviously, it's not something I would ever do, nor can I do. It's not worth losing my law license over. But when people are at end of life and they, you know, with medical advances and all that, some people hang on for much longer than they want to. And, you know, I have a lot of spiritual conversations. The majority of what I do are spiritual conversations with people. At the end of the day, I create legal documents. But most of the time when I'm talking to clients, it's I'm having spiritual conversations and they're not it is never me speaking. It's information coming through me. I'd say 99% of what I say is information coming through me, uh, relaying to the client. Um, but so we, we just have, you know, I try and bring them back to look, there's a reason why you're on this planet and you have the ability to leave whenever you want. This is up to you, not up to me. Um, you don't need to take a medication to leave your body. You can leave your body. And I've had clients leave their body. I've had clients say, okay, I'm not doing this. I'm not going into hospice. You're not putting me on medication. You know, you're not putting me on life support. No problem. You have the ability to leave. And I walk out of the room and they pass away. Like, it's really incredible stuff to see. What a great segue (laughs) for part two. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to um, talk more about spirituality. Wow, that was quite the education on estate planning with Donna. And I am sure everyone has gained a new perspective and the importance of a proper and good estate plan. In part two, Donna dives into her spiritual conversations that she has with her clients and how she's more than an estate planning attorney for them, as they often involve reconnecting clients with their spirituality. Donna discusses how living without fear of death can enhance life's quality, the importance of integrating spirituality into your professional life, and the spiritual side of estate planning, including the power of your choices in life and death. So please stay with us for part two and be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, show some love in the comments and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. It helps us more than you realize. See you next time on Sunday Communion Podcast.